Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now on the stream. Welcome. This is the pre-show where we get to talk about some of the issues that are current and on our minds. We're going to go live on television in just a little bit. And afterwards, we'll be having the post-show where we dive deeper into some of the issues that have been raised. Joining me today is Sana Saeed in from Montreal. It's a pleasure to have you, Sana. Nice to be here. So uh, we just got news that Egypt has uh, decided that they're going to open up the Rafa crossing on Saturday permanently. What do you think is going to be the impact of that? I think it's going to be huge, um, not only in terms of the actual practicality of, uh, of what it means, but I think also symbolically there's a lot yeah. of meaning of this. Um, and I would hope that this also signifies, um, I think it does, the new uh, direction that Palestinian-Egyptian relations are now going to take in the post-January 25th, you know, Revolution. You know, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that the foreign minister said they were going to do this, like, I mean, he made his statements weeks ago, and then they nothing happened. Right. So what do you think was going on between him? Because he didn't have to state they were going to open the Rafa crossing. He could have waited until they were ready to do it. Why do you think that he said it then, and then there was this lag, and why now all of a sudden say, okay, we're doing it in a couple of days? Well, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily that easy to go and just open up you know, the border, um, yeah. the gate so easily. And I think there was probably a lot of um, probably bureaucratic push around, also a lot of political considerations to take into consideration. Yeah. Um, so I think um, they probably were also looking for maybe more opportune moment um, and perhaps waiting perhaps after, you know, President Obama's recent speech, yeah. um, you know, and Yahoo's visit uh, to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. It just kind of seems to be, See, I mean, it's, it's not just a, um, again, it's not just practical, but it's really symbolic. So for that to happen, as the aftermath to the you know these recent speeches and everything you know everyone's been talking about the situation i mean you know netanyahu with six seven borders and obama so i yeah. think it's it's a much more symbolic and has a much more mm. power behind it yeah you know it's interesting because i was thinking that is there a reason why how is this connected to netanyahu's visit and obama's speech because basically netanyahu gave a major address before congress yesterday and Egypt makes this announcement today. And it seems like almost Egypt is staying, saying like, look, we are going to be a player in this. Like we are a nation of influence and we are definitely going to be contributing our voice to however this is going to be resolved. What do you think is the role that Egypt can or should be playing? Um, I think Egypt is probably, it's in a really good position uh, right now to actually um, Take on a, first of all, the, the Israeli-Palestinian issue needs a regional broker of some sort, right? Yes. You already have the United States involved, but you also need someone who is within the region. Um, so I think that Egypt, considering now that it has, I mean, although it still has a long way to go, it has, quote unquote, successfully emerged yeah. from, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the onslaught of, and again, January 25th, the revolution. Um, so it's an ongoing process, but I think it's, done a lot already to show the direction I think that it's interested in heading. We see from the Egyptian people themselves, um, you know, that they're out there protesting um, in solidarity with the Palestinians. Yeah. Um, we've seen the government also take on um, initiatives, for instance, the Hamas and the Fatah uh, reconciliation. Yeah. Um, that's significant. I mean, some people might say, well, is it really, you know, eh. No, but I, it is I significant. Think it's, I think it's, it's clearly significant. significant because, I mean, you figure Egypt is, is nascent in its new form. Nobody knows really where it's going to go. And yet they've taken this stance. Like you mentioned, they, they worked on that uh, rapprochement between Fatah and and Hamas, and now they've opened the Rafa crossing. You know, one of the things, so you're an expert to some degree in <laughs> Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the sense that you're doing your masters and you're studying um, Palestine and what's happened in the wake of the Oslo Accords. Yeah. So what do you think is going to be the impact of this on the lives of the people in Gaza? And the reason why I ask is because, okay, granted, on the one hand, people say, like, oh, it's opening the borders. There's going to be flow of trade, and it's going to be economically beneficial. People see family and friends and be connected to the world. But I'm sure that Israel is also going to make some kind of move in response. So what do you think is going to happen? Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I would not be surprised uh, for Israel to take, uh, you know, stricter measures regarding the siege um, with the uh, um, with Gaza. Also, perhaps, uh, I mean, it definitely does also strain Israeli-Egyptian um, yeah. relations. Yeah. So that will be really interesting to see um, as to, and I, you know, is, is a lot of Israelis and particularly those in the government have 
um, you know, espoused concerns about the route that Egypt will now take. You know, anywhere yeah. from like, oh my gosh, Muslim Brotherhood, you know, Islamist takeover to, well, actually, that's pretty much it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, they're they're really concerned. They're yeah. really concerned about that. And so I'm sure. I mean, while a lot of us may look at this, like, this is great. You yeah. know, finally, you know, Gaza is under siege, and even though it's been lessened, not really that much. Yeah. Um, this is a really good step in uh, in, uh, in the right direction. Yeah. Um, for easing the humanitarian crisis that does exist in Gaza, um, but it'll, I, but I think Israel is going to spin that in a very negative way mm. regarding Egypt, as you know, Egypt is taking that direction. It's going to probably break the treaty, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. the peace treaty. Um, and I think it'll, I think it's 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 tough to say right now exactly what steps Israel will take because it's yeah. slightly Cause unpredictable never, at times. But I think um, I think it's going to be um, it's definitely going to maybe get more aggressive at least rhetorically. Okay, so I've got another question to that. Before we do, I want to check our Skype, our Toronto Ahmed. Can you hear us? Me? Yes, you. Yes, you. Couldn't okay. be. All right, all right. Sarah, can you hear us? I can hear you. How okay, are you? thanks to both for joining us. How's the weather in Canada? Beautiful. Great, beautiful, okay, awesome. stunning. We're going to come back to you in just a sec. We're, we're going to uh, go to, to live on air in like 90 seconds. Great. Okay, so quickly, here's the thing, because we, we've talked about this before on the program, and uh, unfortunately we haven't had an Israeli guest to give their side of the perspective yet, but a question that I think I, I brought it up in the past and I still think about is, okay, Israel is going to say, hey, arms can go into Gaza uh, if you open the crossing. Isn't that a valid concern? It is a valid concern for sure. I mean, I mean, it's, again, if you're looking from the perspective, the state security, Israel, you know, they're big on security. Um, uh, it is a concern, but uh, we would hope also that uh, their Egyptian authorities would at least have some sort of. I mean, it's not. I don't think it's going to be complete free flow where it's just going to be, you know, uh, yeah. go as you please and yeah. almost met like, you know, blurring the border between Gaza and Egypt. I yeah. think there will be some sort There'll of There will have to be some control. Security. Yeah, exactly. and, I mean, security. and it's going to have to, it, it's going to cause, in some ways, a, a need for a close relationship between exactly. Israel and Egypt in order to maintain exactly. security. Okay, so we're going to go live. Uh, thanks so much for joining us in the pre-show. We're about to go live on air. Stick with us, and we'll see you in a few. I'm Derek Ashong and you are now in the stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. As always, we're bringing you stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, breaking Gaddafi's media blackout, how young Libyans are fighting for their country's future online. Joining us on the couch today is blogger, journalist, and Kebab Fest editor, Sana Saeed. Sana, welcome to the stream. Tell us what Kebab Fest is. So, as we like to describe ourselves, we're the activist, irreverent, Arab American, and others blog. Uh, we like to pro uh, provide a platform for um, activists from all over the world um, dealing with issues affecting everyone, essentially. And uh, particularly, we focus a lot on um, uh, North America and, again, particularly uh, in the Middle East. But we do extend to other areas, and, uh, we're, and we like to add a little bit of humor to our political analysis and whatnot. Well, uh, you know, you sent me a couple of articles that were posted by guests on Kadab, Kebab Fest, and they were, there was some serious debate going down about the issues related to Libya that we're going to be discussing today. So it's great to have you, and I'm looking forward to getting your insights. Uh, also with us today, as always, is our digital producer, Ahmed Shihab el -Din. As you can notice, he is not on the orange couch today. He's joining us via Skype from the Mesh Conference in Toronto. With him is Sarah Abdurrahman, who is also uh, a Libyan activist, and she's there as well. Sarah, we're going to come back to you in just a second. But Ahmed, before we speak to Sarah, tell us what Mesh is. Mesh is essentially dubbed a Canada's web conference, and it's two or three days of lots of different conversations about media, but also about business. So it's the converging of those worlds. 
Okay, so that's obviously some interesting stuff. I'm sure you're schooling them. A lot of stream <laughs> knowledge up there. <laughs> Tell we're us trying what kind to. We're trying to. No doubt, no doubt. Well, what kind of stuff have people been, been telling us in the stream? Um, well, you know, we've had a lot of feedback and a lot of comments on a story that we covered yesterday of the protests in Spain, uh, what they're calling the Spanish Revolution or the hashtag that they're using. Um, and in response, we have a tweet that came from DJ Zabor. Um, he says, as for Basques, there's no democracy in Spain. Pro-independence parties are banned. And he's hoping that the Spanish Revolution will bring about real democracy. We also have another tweet uh, on the topic of Basques, which are a minority group uh, that live in a region between Spain and France, the north of Spain, the, the south of France. They're saying, despite the ban, Basques have showed overwhelming support for the pro-independence party in the polls last Sunday. So we're seeing that you know, even minorities are getting engaged in this process of protest. So it seems like this is, I mean, it's almost like this revolutionary fervor is just continuing to build in different places. We'll We'll see how much uh, all of these things play out. We'll continue to monitor that story. What else have you got? Yeah, we also have, you know, speaking of protests in different places, in Morocco on Sunday there was a crackdown by the government. Um, what we have in terms of protesters in Rabat, and they were chasing, you know, hundreds of activists. We have a video today that was sent to us, in fact, several videos from a user named Aruz Mazik, showing footage of doctors protesting today in Rabat. As you can see, I'm going to try and play uh, some of the video, but I'm going to speak over it. What you see is protesters in the streets of the capital. And a lot of people are saying there's a zero tolerance policy right now in terms of protests that the police are taking. Um, so this is a new kind of development, and we're going to be tracking this story. And, uh, you know, I just want to take the time to tell our viewers that, you know, no matter where we are and no matter where you are, we really rely on you to keep sending us these stories from across the world. So you can always tweet us at AJStream and share our stories. Um, my name is Laura Ellis. I'm a blogger from Washington, D.C., and I'm in the stream. Libya's social media activists, those inside and outside of the country, are working around the clock to keep the world informed about what's happening in their homeland. For many, the risk couldn't be greater. As the country's longtime ruler, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, has initiated a brutal crackdown on those who've been opposing his rule. I've got an image of protesters in Libya on my screen, which we thought was very compelling, but we've been hearing them. This is actually from an article from Kebab Fest, which, Sana, you're obviously a part of. Uh, and we've been talking about this questions of whether or not the invasion of Libya, or at least, let's not call it an invasion, the no-fly zone, the NATO-led airstrikes, are representative of something that is uh, maybe contrary to Libyan autonomy and, and, and sovereignty, or whether this is a legitimate support of the Libyan people. Now, I want to bring a Libyan activist into uh, this conversation. Sarah Abdurrahman is joining us, as we mentioned, via Skype from Toronto. She is an activist and she's involved in the MESH conference there. Sarah, tell us a little bit about this. Uh, well, more specifically, I want to know your impressions of the NATO airstrikes. It's been happening for a while, seems to be an impasse on the ground. Do you feel that the airstrikes continue to be justified? Uh, and what's your impression of what's happening thus far in Libya? I think the strikes definitely continue to be justified, and, and even last night in advance of coming onto the show, I, I talked to somebody in Benghazi and somebody in Tripoli just to make sure I wasn't uh, overstepping my, uh, my opinions about it. But across the board, it seems like people are very grateful for the NATO intervention. Um, NATO came in at a time when literally Gaddafi soldiers were lining up uh, tank missiles to, to shoot at Benghazi. So I don't think that there's any doubt in anybody's mind that a lot of lives were saved by NATO intervening in the country. And I think that um, if anything, the people that I've spoken to on the ground there wish that NATO was doing more. Um, they realize, you know, within the constraints that they have financially and with the limited uh, weapons and resources that they have, that there's only so much that they can do on their own. And so if anything, you know, it's it's a it's a very strange thing to say that they're actually cheering whenever they hear NATO explosions around mm -hmm. them. I mean, just imagine what kind of circumstances they're under to be cheering for for bombs falling in their country. But I think if anything, um, people people want more of it. Um, people realize that it's necessary that they need that help to level the playing field. I mean, they're they're the, these are people that before the February 17th revolution didn't even have weapons. So I mean the 
and and they're fighting you know a full a full blown army and then well, help Sarah, from Sarah, let me jump in and ask you a question because I want to make sure we we explore both sides of this uh, debate and we have a post that actually Sana sent me from Kebab Fest. This is a post by a guest uh, blogger Rokaya Shamsedin and she it's entitled The Price of Dignity in Libya. And she is saying that the humanitarian intervention in Libya is a farce. It is a storyline developed to stroke the ego of every nationalist still reeling from the pillaging of Iraq. How would you respond to that? Well, first of all, I'm very sick of the Iraq-Libya comparisons. I don't think that you can take two countries that just happen to speak Arabic and say, uh, whose language happens to be Arabic, and say that they're similar situations. They're very different situations. Um, Second of all, I think that the framing of NATO as an imperialist power that's coming in and, and, and conquering this this Arab country is very much in line with the Gaddafi regime's rhetoric. And it's just another one of many ways that he tries to divide people inside and outside of the country. And it's just another uh, one of his many um, tactics to try to get his own agenda across. Um, if you watch Libyan State TV, I think they call them uh, NATO the colonialist colonizing crusaders and some other mm. uh, long alliteration. Um, and really, it's just it's just to divide people and say, for example, if there was anybody on the fence before about whether or not we wanted the Gaddafi regime to, to crumble, now yeah. we can point out, look, there's this outside power coming in. They're going to take over the country. Now you got to, if, you, if you're either with us or you're with them. And, and it's just a, a sort of a shortcut to divide the country. And I think most people on the ground there are not buying into that. I think that right now, the agenda, the, the goal is clear people just want the regime to fall what's going to happen after it i mean that's a question for 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 when that day comes and i think that if anything what people are learning from the arab spring is that they have a voice that that, that the mass is 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 a powerful entity the masses of people are a power, powerful Sarah, entity l- let me jump in there because i want to get some of sana's uh thoughts on this particular issue of the people having a voice and it seems that a lot of the voices that we've heard thus far are in support of the revolution in Libya and in support of this idea of NATO helping out. Mm -hmm. But there's been, you guys have hosted a very, very substantive and very uh, passionate debate on your website about this very issue. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about these allegations of a potential colonial um, endeavor at place. I mean, isn't there a risk that if you have the uh, Western forces impose a new uh, reality on the ground in Libya, that that reality may transcend the departure of Gaddafi. It's true. Um, I mean, I think Sarah makes some good points. Um, I don't know if I answer. I mean, she said she, you know, she's sick of the Iraq and Libya um, comparison. I agree to an extent that is really um, uh, drawn out. But I mean, I, I don't think that comparison is just coming out of it simply being two countries that speak Arabic, but also the fact that um, Iraq, for instance, prior to the 2003 invasion, um, had a history of um, actually, a very long history of having, you know, for instance, two uh, no-fly zones established, right? And mm-hmm. and that didn't really turn out that well. Yeah. And those and no-fly zones ex- went on for a long time. They went time. on for a long time, and you had France that left in 98 because it was like, we want out of here. And um, after a while, the U.S. and the, and, uh, the U.K. were accused also of uh, breaching international law. And it was a bit of a mess. And even today, Russia came out saying that, you know, um, that NATO is essentially uh, violating U.N. resolutions. But... Regarding, um, it's, it, I think it ends up being one of those catch-22 situations. Yeah. Had nothing, had, you know, it was very obvious what was happening in Libya. I mean, Libyans were uh, being massacred, essentially. Yeah. Um, so had the international community done nothing, mm-hmm. um, which, as we all know, international community, a.k.a. the NATO, um, you know, there would have been a lot of ridicule, right? Yes. What happened to never again, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, that kind of line. Um, and, but and even that, there, there is still, at this point, still some of that criticism because people argue, well, what about Bahrain? Exactly. What about Yemen? Yemen. Okay, well, now Syria. what about Syria? You yeah, know, exactly. Which is a great... And, and, that's, and of course, I mean, I don't think we should try to fool ourselves that this yeah. is a, some sort of a humanitarian... Yeah. Um, because if it was humanitarian, then why not Syria? Why yeah, not exactly. Bahrain? They're why always not Yemen? Why not Yemen? I, I want to get uh, a guest actually on the ground in Libya involved in this conversation. He, joining us from Benghazi is Libyan medical student Ahmed Sanala. He's been living in Benghazi for the last four years. He's a political and social media activist who's been with the uprising since its beginning. Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about what our sentiments like in Benghazi right now with regard to the NATO airstrikes. 
Um, well, we would like more, to be honest. Um, more airstrikes, um, so we can get rid of this guy uh, as quick as possible, um, so we can save more lives. Okay, so now we've been seeing comments, people arguing either both sides of the equation. Some are saying, yes, we want the airstrikes. Others are saying, well, we, th we fear the consequences of having Western powers intervene. Are you seeing a similar debate in Benghazi, or is there a unified support? No, absolutely not. There's a there's a definitely a unified support for for the continuation of airstrikes. Um, however, um, if ground troops were to be deployed, then that would be a problem. But um, as far as air support, then definitely yes, we want them. Um, there's you know people dance and sing every time they hear that Babel Azizia has been shelled. Now, I want to so, ask you uh, one more question. We've got a lot of comments coming in from Twitter, but I want to ask you a question before we go to, to our audience. And that is, you know, this uh, has dragged on beyond the point that some people have had expected given the relative speed of what transpired in Tunisia and in Egypt earlier this year. Are, are people still hopeful? Are people still believing in the revolution? Or do you sense any kind of fatigue? Um, fatigue... Fatigue is a good word. Fatigue is definitely set in. Um, uh, the enthusiasm and the groundswell that existed, uh, the enthusiasm is still there. It's just the adrenaline and, and the pump that you know that that drove people to to protest um, kind of has kind of died down. But um, it's almost like the the war is protracted, and now people it's almost become like a job, mm. like a, a mission, you know, to to, to, to continue. And to get rid of this guy. That's that's really but, um, fascinating. Uh, he, he, he life in Benghazi is just fantastic. You know that that's really interesting. The idea that son of that it's become like a job, like it is mm. just the way things are, and people are mm. so committed that they're living that way. Now I notice you've been hearing some feedback from people on Twitter. What yeah. have you got for us today? Um, well, one was I mean it, I think it's interesting. I think Amit, you said that um, there was a unified support for the airstrikes. Although I've also read to the contrary a bit. Um, you know there are people who. Uh, from again, what I've been reading, there are a lot of uh, Libyans who say, yes, it's great that you know we did get NATO intervention, but mm -hmm. we're not fooling ourselves as to what this is about. Ultimately, yeah. as well, that our resources. But I did have one um, question which I liked, and it's kind of taking a bit of a different direction. It's by a Visible Defiance on Twitter, and here she asks, sorry, don't know. Um, I would be curious how Libyan opposition will better represent themselves to other governments as an alternative to Gaddafi. Continuing, in reference to Libya's oppositional National Transi Transitional Council being invited to uh, to open a representative office in Washington, D.C. So let's let's uh, give some context to that. So basically, D.C. has offered some certain measure of recognition of this Transitional Council yes. by asking them to uh, uh, to or at least uh, inviting them to set up offices here. Russia has also made kind of a provisional acceptance that's saying like we recognize that you are legitimate uh, you know, parties, interlocutors for the uh, the Libyan people, but they've not gone as far as countries like Qatar that have said we recognize you as the sole interlocutor. So, what does that mean for what's happening on the ground when the international community has partially recognized the opposition, but not entirely? Um, it's interesting. I'm not. I would not be entirely sure as to what it means. I mean, I think it creates some problems in terms of um, now you have particular countries that are backing these. Um, the the uh, National Transitional Council, right? And yeah. you have others who aren't. Um, so uh, the direction and the question a lot of people are asking is, well, where does Libya head after Gaddafi falls, right? Today, yeah. uh, President Obama and um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron came out and said that we're committed until Gaddafi falls. So if we take that, that, okay, this is happening until Gaddafi falls, um, then what happens afterwards? I mean, the, the opposition mm -hmm. forces are, are very young, yep. inexperienced, and scarce. Um, so... I think the fact that there's support for them is, I mean, some may say it's good, but it's also a bit troubling because, I mean... See, I think that, I think it's, this is a really dangerous situation. And, and the reason is because of all the politics that surround it. You don't want to see the optics of another Western international force invading an mm -hmm. Arab or Muslim country as we've seen in Iraq. And, and in Afghanistan, which is not an uh, Arab country, but is still an Islamic nation, Islamic nation. So the West has chosen to take a sort of the lighter option, which is the airstrikes. But in so doing, because the opposition is not a trained military force, that you're seeing this impasse. Maybe, yeah, if the West hadn't got involved, NATO wasn't involved, maybe Gaddafi runs through everybody. But as it stands, 
I don't know that that status quo is going to be resolved quickly or cleanly. Yeah. So uh, it, it makes you wonder, you know, it, would the right thing have been to have had ground troops come in? Mm-hmm. Or would it have been to do what was actually done? And I want to see if we actually got our guests back. And I want to come to you, Sarah, on this one. Um, we're just talking about this question of whether or not we should, if this might wind up being a drawn out thing, would you have rather seen a more robust military intervention by NATO? Or do you think that the way it's been done has been right? Um, I think... I don't think that there's anybody that is um, on the side of having um, troops on the ground. I think if if it were to be more robust, the only way that people would want it to be more robust would be to be more aggressive in their airstrikes. Um, I think that... You know, I want, I want to get Ahmed to respond to that same point. And let's go with Ahmed Sanala in Benghazi. Ahmed, uh, Sarah is saying that people don't necessarily want a military intervention on the ground. You had said that you want more airstrikes. Let's say that more airstrikes don't do the job. Would you support an actual, uh, actual foreign troops on the ground in Libya? No. No, absolutely not. What, what is then required is for the freedom fighters to be armed. Um, and then we continue the fight here on the ground. There, they are more than capable to finish this on the ground themselves if they were armed correctly, there, properly, and had an uh, air support. Okay, there, and I think our video is frozen a little bit, uh, but we still heard you, Ahmed. Thanks for that. I want to come to Ahmed in Toronto in just a second because I see we've got some additional feedback online. But, Sarah, I think you wanted to, to finish a point. Yes, I, it's not all or nothing. It's not uh, airstrikes or boots on the ground. It's not one extreme or the other. Um, there are other things that can happen to aid um, the rebels without putting, you know, an influx of troops on the ground. For example, you know, um, taking some of those frozen assets and 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 letting get, uh, allocating some resources that um, rightfully belong to the Libyan people anyway, and having them be able to help themselves a little bit more. They can buy weapons, they can buy medicine, they can buy food, they can buy other supplies that they're lacking right now. Mm-hmm. It's not if this particular NATO strike doesn't succeed on its own, automatically let's send troops in. There are other things that can happen in between one extreme or the other. Okay. Ahmed, I want to come to you really quickly. Uh, in Toronto, what kind of stuff are you seeing? Uh, what kind of comments are we getting online about this? You know, there's a really nuanced conversation going on around whether NATO should have intervened. And we spoke earlier in the show about Iraq and, and you know, comparing it to that. We have iron chariots saying that it seems relevant that the people of Iraq did not ask us to attack their government, whereas the people of Libya did. So an obvious, you know, clarification. But then we also have Alex Silio saying if the international community did nothing, it could have turned out like Rwanda. And so he's Mm. basically highlighting that no matter what the West does, either way, NATO gets criticism. And the last tweet we'll throw in there is Gail Masengi is saying... Libya has always been a priority to NATO, and it still is, because for a long time, the West couldn't control it under Gaddafi. So the question is, I guess to everybody, is NATO's history with Libya really telling as to why they went in? Okay, well, we've, um, we've lost uh, Ahmed in Benghazi, so we're not going to go to him. But I want to go, come to you, Sarah, to get your thoughts on that. And then, Sana, I want to get some of your impressions as well. But, Sarah, what do you think of that last comment? Yeah, I, I agree 100%. There, you know, before before the the resolution was passed, everybody was saying NATO needs to do more. NATO needs to do more. Even in this, in, in excuse me, in the states, um, people were criticizing the Obama government for not doing enough. And then once um, they signed on um, to the no fly zone with NATO, they were criticized for doing too much. And you're never going to make everybody happy. That's yeah. that's a given. Yeah. Um, but I think I think. It's, I don't think that there's anybody that I've spoken to on the ground in Libya, and we speak to a wide spectrum of people who have said they wished it didn't happen. Everybody mm-hmm. across the board is grateful for it, and if anything, the criticism is we need more. And we need it in, in places that have been that had previously been neglected. For example, immediately when the no-fly zone was imposed, they stopped attacks on Benghazi, but there was still a lot of ag- uh, aggressive attacks by the Gaddafi government in the Western Mountain yeah. region. Now NATO has picked up the mm-hmm. game in that area and is starting to do more too. But the criticism has really just been, it needs to, to be more aggressive, if anything, barring actually having troops on the ground. So Sana, let me get your thoughts on this. So let's say that Gaddafi digs in and he sticks around for a little while, mm-hmm. but eventually you figure the man is going to go. 
is there any infrastructure for there to be an actual uh, transition to a government that is going to be more representative of the Libyan people? Or are the interests that have intervened on behalf of the Libyan people also going to want to see something in return, which may not necessarily mm -hmm. be the same kind of, uh, of reality on the ground that the revolutionaries might have expected from mm -hmm. the outset? Mm -hmm. um, no, that's exactly it. I, I mean, I, I think that's, I think the interests that are at play are probably going to take a much more a stronger hold onto the transitional period once Gaddafi is gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something to be expected. I, 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 I don't think that's necessarily something that's shocking that, oh my gosh, what do you mean NATO won't hand over absolutely <laughs> all power and representation to the Libyan people? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a political organization and these are states we're talking about which have particular interests and all states usually act in their own interests, yeah. right? So I don't think... Um, I, I think that the transitional period is going to be filled with a lot of, again, uh, international interest at play. But I would really hope that eventually it would lead to um, greater, you know, democratic representation for the yeah. Libyan people themselves, where they themselves can, you know, um, take on their own governance. Well, so there's some interesting comment that's coming in online. Ahmed, this is a question that I think we should pose to Sarah. Uh, can yeah. you tell us what you're seeing? Yeah, it's just a good summation, you know, because we're all looking to the future now. They're in a stalemate. And ex Shiner is asking, what about a peacekeeping force after Gaddafi if there is a civil war? What do you think of that, Sarah? Um, again, I think the talk of civil war is just another one of those divisive tactics that I told that I mentioned earlier. I mean, across the board, the people in the east, the people in the west are all saying that they're united. The people in the east are saying that Tripoli is the capital. The people in Tripoli are saying that we support the transitional council. What we're seeing is unity unlike anything that we've seen in this country before. So I think that threat of civil war is just one of those many things that Gaddafi has thrown out there to scare people into keeping him in power. Um, but would I they need to keep peace, a peacekeeping force? or no? You know, that's something that we'd have to figure out when the time comes. Okay. It doesn't seem like there's that, that that would be the case from what I'm seeing now, but I'm not there on the ground, so I don't know. But one thing that I do want to mention before we're, we're finished is that um, as far as other foreign powers coming in once the Gaddafi regime falls and, um, you know, having their interests or wanting to have some say in what happens. One thing that the Arab Spring is teaching um, people across the region and, and, and one thing that I'm sure the Libyan people will take away from um, the end of the Gaddafi regime is that they have a voice. They're not going to get rid of one dictator that's been there for 40 plus years and then just say, OK, we'll take whatever comes. So, next. Sarah, on now that point, I want to pause. I want to ask you to pause. We're going to continue this conversation on our website. You can check us out at stream. I'll Zero.com for the post show. You're going to find more analysis on our website as well. Tweet us at AJ Stream. We will see you online. Hi, and welcome to The Post Show. We're going to get deeper into this conversation about what's going on in Libya right now. Uh, Sana, Sarah left us with a very, very interesting point, that after going through all of this struggle and all of this drama, that the Libyan people would not likely trade one dictator for another. What are your thoughts? No, and I think that's a completely valid point. And that mm -hmm. also, I mean, she makes an excellent point, I think, in regards to the fact that what you have now, perhaps the most powerful uh, force emerging from the Arab Spring is this renewed sense of agency that um, people across the Middle East now have, which is, mm -hmm. you know, that they can take their own future and lives, you know, into their own hands. So I think she makes a great point. And, and, and I mean, um, there's also the possibility that were Gaddafi just to be replaced with some sort of um, you know, uh, as it's been referred to, some colonial force or whatever. Yeah. Um, I I would think that, yeah, that I agree that I feel the Libyan people would also rise up against that. So, Ahmed, I want to get your input on this because I think this is a, a really interesting time. I mean, we're looking at countries that are basically, in the case of Libya, you have a nation that was under colonial rule that is now actually engaged with some of its former colonial uh, uh, rulers in an effort to liberate the nation on behalf of the people. Is it that we're possibly in a moment in history where we have so much access to information and so much knowledge that we can't reinforce or you know, reintegrate those old colonial patterns? Or uh, is this a moment where we have to be cautious because history tends to repeat itself? 
You know, I think it's a really interesting point you raise because that's been much of the discussion here at this conference. You know, is this a new point in history? Is what we're seeing these shifts? Are these a result of, you know, years of, of failed policies? What is this really that's happening? Because it's happening really quickly. And is it is it a result of social media? You know, I, I don't know the answer to it. But what, one question I think will be really curious is we keep talking about peacekeeping missions after potentially Gaddafi, you know, is overthrown. But I wonder, is it the National Front for the Salvation of Libya, which is one of the main opposition groups that was founded in 1981 and that a lot of my friends who mm. live in the Libyan diaspora are members of, or is it the Transitional Council? And, you know, how will that play into the very question that you asked? Who will lead Libya in the future, or or even now in the inter interim? Yeah, so, so, Sarah, I definitely want your thoughts on this, because you're a Libyan living in the diaspora, and we know that, the as um, uh, Ahmed mentioned, groups like the National Front have been uh, in existence for a long time. They have a lot more... Uh, political experience, let's say, than the new opposition forces coming out of Benghazi. At the same time, some of the most experienced operatives in the NTC, in Benghazi, are actual former members of the Gaddafi regime. Right. Are you not concerned that as this transition goes, that even though you may have a new leader, that leadership may be reflective of the principles of the old regime? Um, no, I would say, first of all, that um, the National Transitional Council has made it clear that anybody that's involved in the council now will not be part of the, the new government. So I don't think that um, there is a worry there. And would um, you support a ban on members of the old government being involved but, in future? But, the, the thing is, the, there are plenty of skilled um, technocrats, and, and, and people that were in the old regime that, or in the old government, not the old regime, I would say, that are good at what they do and that didn't necessarily align themselves with the policies of the Gaddafi regime. So I don't think that you need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't think that um, if you have a skilled technocrat that was part of the previous government that they should be barred from any future government. Right. Definitely not. Um, and I think... Um, as far as how you're going to reconcile all of these different groups, the National Front for the Salvation of Libya is one of many groups that are um, sort of working now alongside each other in, you know, trying to uh, get aid to the country and figure out wh wh what the direction it's going to go in. It happens to be one of the ones with the longest history. But I think that as long as everybody feels like they're represented um, in whatever the future government is, I don't think that it would be a problem um, for for you know the leader for um, excuse me for there to be anybody that worked in the previous government to be a part of the new government that doesn't there 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 are plenty of skilled people in the but, country that just they that's where they work so okay, yeah forgive so, me Sana, I want to I want to actually get your thoughts on something basically we're the the essence of this story for us is we're looking at how people are activating themselves in this revolutionary moment. We are having the opportunity to, we talked with Ahmed Sanala on the ground in Benghazi. We have Asara joining us from Toronto. And it seems like this next generation seems to be feeling very empowered in pushing towards change. This is something that is now becoming uh, a pan-Arab uh, movement. What happens if in Libya the struggle for freedom is drawn out? It's long, it's bloody, it's painful, which change historically often is that way. Right. What does that do to the spirit of this Arab revolution overall? I don't think, I mean, if it does happen, I mean, I think what we're seeing right now, let me start off with, I mean, there's something that was alluded to, I think either by Sarah, I can't remember if it was Sarah or Ahmed, um, but I think what we're seeing right now is, um, I mean, I think people easily forget that uh, colonialism ended not too long ago, right? It's yes. only been, and in some countries, it's only been a couple of decades and so yeah. on and so forth. So I think what we're seeing right now is basically this entire a, a, a cleansing of the whatever the remnants of colonization slash even the process of decolonization, which is usually very, very um, drawn out. So it may be bloody. It may be, and that's unfortunate, but that I, I don't think it will necessarily um, disempower uh, the uh, people of the Middle East, of North Africa. Um, I think, if anything, it's the idea of finally um, having the ability to control your own governance, to have a voice in, uh, your, in what, again, it, uh, dictates your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and even with your resources, I think that prospect is seen as something that's much better than 
um, what the, the status quo it, which it is right now, which is being disrupted. So I think, I mean, I, in a way, I'm kind of I'm, I'm a little hesitant sometimes to call it the Arab Revolution mm -hmm. because I think that it's a lot more than that. I think what we're seeing is a big shift um, from, and this is kind of, a lot of people have alluded to, you know, I mean, very famously, you had uh, Samuel Huntington who said clash of civilizations, but then a critique of that has been that, no, if anything, there may be a clash between the global north and the global south type of thing. So, mm -hmm. I mean... Or, or maybe there's a fusion of civilizations, because right now, you have a lot of people around the world saying, hey, we want to have viable democracy. We want to have self-actualization. Right. We want to have agency. We want to have a voice in the affairs of our world. And that seems yeah. to be kind of a universal principle. Ahmed, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I just want to get in here with a quick uh, tweet and then talk a little bit about the future. I mean, I don't want to speculate too much, but Curious Tip is writing us a question. Uh, what is expected to happen to the pro-Gaddafi supporters in society? And we spoke a little bit about this. He's asking, will they be shunned, accepted, victimized? Because he thinks this could lead to future problems. And the reason I bring this up is because mm -hmm. the U.S. government and the West was very reluctant at first to arm the uh, you know, rebels or the opposition because they were worried they didn't understand who these people were and they wanted mm -hmm. to kind of get a sense of who they were. And then you know, out emerged Mahmoud Jibril, who's been coming and spending most of his time not in Libya, where the fight is taking place, but yeah. meeting with you know Western leaders, and he is one of those people who was a pro Gaddafi supporter. And even though we yeah. spoke about it briefly, I'm really just curious. You know, are we really expecting that this interim council will just all of a sudden disappear? And well, I, you, you know, know uh, this is the other interesting thing, Ahmed. I'm so glad you brought that up because we, you know one of the of the things we saw when we were researching this story is that there have been reports of some of the Western-backed insurgents actually forming um, death squads and and killing. Uh, pro-regime people in cities like Benghazi, right. and so the the the, the issue, and it, it's very difficult to to you know verify all that's happening right. in any war zone. But the question is, all right, you get rid of one dictator, and and I say this in part because you know coming from a country that also was liberated from colonialism, we look yeah. at what happened, and you think, oh, the British were bad, the British were bad. Now you put in one government, they get uh, deposed by the military. Now you get to have you know another good 40, 50 years of military rule, and then you, people like me grow up with an American accent because you can't go home. <laughs> and right. part of the yeah. problem is, I, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical about right. the idea that just because you have a change, it necessarily means it's going to be a positive change. So, Sarah, yeah. to you, uh, uh, one of the things I'm wondering is how does Libya avoid literally trading one bad scenario for another? How do we know who these new leaders are? Well, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine anything worse than Gaddafi, to be honest. Um, I'll politician. just say one, let I'm me not, jump in and say I, one I, thing. I think yeah. that when Libya got its independence, nobody imagined anything worse than colonialism, mm. right? right? And then right. you got yeah. Gaddafi. Right. Point. That's right. why we're having think, this conversation. And I don't, think, I don't think the fear of the unknown should stop people and should yeah. keep people being passive and accepting mm -hmm. the very negative situations that they're under. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we, none of us knows what's going to happen. I think, first of all, the Gaddafi regime has not fallen yet. So one one thing is we need to keep our eye on the prize and remember that if we start getting bogged down by what's going to happen next and, and is there going to be a civil war and is there going to be this and is there going to be that, all of these things are going to distract people from the goal and that's part of what the government is trying to do is to distract people from the goal. Right. Let's get that goal as, let's get that goal accomplished, and then we can focus on what's happening next. Yes, there is possibilities for other negative situations to come out of it, but again, what I said earlier is that I think now people realize that there is a push and pull. It is no longer one person on top dictating what everything that's going to happen underneath. Now people realize they have a voice, they have agency. If, if, if they don't like what's happening, they have a way of a, a recourse for changing what's happening. And yeah, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be messy. I mean, so, you're, so you're, on, you're, and on that point, we're running out of time, but that you actually make an interesting point, And I think that Sana has something that reinforces it. Would you re share with that? With there us? was a great tweet um, by uh, Tasbih Harwis. Um, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, who said, when I spoke to family in Libya back in February, they said, even if this takes years. Okay, so clearly it seems that people are feeling a very strong commitment to making this change 
happen? And uh, Ahmed, I, th I think you wanted to make a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, you know, that question that you raised, I think, really highlights a broader point that doesn't just apply to Libya. And even though we don't want to necessarily equate all these Arab countries and presume that they're all the same, it's important to note that in this spirit of change, we shouldn't dictate what democracy should be. Um, you know, something happened similar in... in I mean, we're Palestine. running out of time in okay, that point. The only point, thing I want to say is I, the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. You know, it, you I got to thank you, Ahmed. I got to thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sana. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We will see you same time tomorrow. Thank you.